Good morning, and welcome to the DCGS Law Enforcement Webinar Series. My name is Ray Neves, and I am the Program Manager for the Gun Involved Violence Elimination Initiative. Today's webinar is entitled, The Importance of Research. This presentation will explain why research is important in the law enforcement community, and how research can benefit both executives and line officers. It will discuss the availability of different types of criminal justice data and research, and there will be demonstrations of both the DCGS Criminal Justice Knowledge Bank and the Research Consortium web pages. This webinar will also feature a moderated question and answer panel focusing on the Research Consortium project being conducted by the Brighton Police Department and Roberts Wesleyan College that is seeking to improve minority recruitment by police departments. Panelists will answer questions regarding the project itself and the mechanics of collaborating through DCGS Research Consortium. Today's presenters will be Mark Shaspis of the Office of Justice Research and Performance, Amanda McGlinchey Tudor of the Office of Justice Research and Performance, Jessica Damrath of the Office of Justice Research and Performance, Chief David Cotholdi, Brighton Police Department, and Director Joseph Testani of the Justice and Security Institute at Robert Wesleyan College. Here are a few housekeeping items before we start. Everyone is muted. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available after the event. Here are the WebEx controls. Panelists will only show the panelists and not the participants. Chat allows the ability to chat with panelists and attendees. Send to all panelists if you need. Q&A allows you to ask questions to the instructor. Please use this feature for your questions. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Exit. To leave the webinar, please click on the red X button. This will prompt you to complete our evaluation and provide additional information if you wish, if you would like this course to be added to the DCGS training record. And now we'll turn the presentation over to Amanda. Thank you, Ray. I'm actually going to turn this over to Mark. Good morning. My name is Mark Shapsis. Thank you very much, Anthony. I am the manager of the policy and performance team in the DCJS Office of Justice Research and Performance. So let me start off by saying thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. And then allow me a, doc, a moment to go over the docket here. You'll be stuck with me for a short discussion about none other than the importance of research in the law enforcement arena. And then we'll turn things over to the real stars of the show for a discussion and demonstration of the DCGS Criminal Justice Knowledge Bank, the research consortium, including that panel discussion on the Brighton JSI Minority Recruitment Project. And then we'll have questions. And as Anthony mentioned, at any time you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A and we will save those questions and they'll be asked in a moderated form towards the end of the today's presentation. So I wanted to start out my little piece here by recalling something I heard at a conference years ago. It was actually a police chief who was doing the talking and he was pointing out just how similar the values and goals of research and policing actually are. Both police and researchers pursue knowledge through systematic investigation of facts and careful assembly of evidence. Both are trained to observe, to assess, and to formulate theories. So whether it is solving a crime, identifying a suspect, or even if it's testing on a hypothesis, the key tenets, the logic progression being applied really is startlingly similar in the two disciplines. So with that, I offer that research can and should be right at home in the law enforcement world. It can help you reach a deeper understanding of the complex inputs that contribute to your local crime problems. 
It can inform or validate a course of action. And we're talking about decision making here. It could help document and celebrate successes. So research and reviews are two different things, right? Research doesn't have to be after the fact, and it certainly doesn't need to be critical. Use research as an ally. And probably one of the more uh, important ones is research can help you become an effective administrator. And here I am talking to all the chiefs and executives in the audience. Research can help guide you and make your case to your constituents. And you have a lot of those constituents, be it the town supervisor, the public, or even your own command staff and officers. Help them understand the why of your decisions. That's really important. Why research is important to line officers and field staff. So I wanna start off by saying that research does not need to be complex, complicated, mathematical, statistical. Research is simply a matter of systemic inquiry. And in fact, applied research can be pretty similar to intelligence. So here we're departing from the type of research designed to uncover something that would be beneficial to the whole field of policing. And instead, we're focusing on the type of research that solves problems or improves practice. And who doesn't want that? See, I've already gotten you halfway to your next commendation. POP or problem-oriented policing. So with any type of proactive techniques, such as POP, deciding how to prioritize problems and design instruments that trigger the outcome you are looking for is especially important. Be more targeted and more efficient. So this one largely speaks for itself, but it's easier said than done. But looking at an issue through a research lens can help you be more focused, be more disciplined about being more targeted. And take care of you. So I know how much everyone loves talking about officer wellness, but before you tune me out completely, let me acknowledge as someone who has been out of the game for quite some time, but at one point strapped on a vest every day, that policing nowadays is harder than ever. So what I'm getting at is that research doesn't have to be about crime reduction or interventions. It could be about officer health. It could be about keeping you all well. And before I get all too preachy here, let me just say, look up wearable sensor technology, or WST. And this is really cool stuff. You know, like this, this runs the gamut from a Fitbit to a full-on telemetry vest. And this is technology that's being developed by the military and the medical field, but wearable sensor technology, there's research going on right now about how this type of stuff can help monitor officer health. What is available to local law enforcement from DCJS or from other New York sources? Well, the first one I'll stop at is data and statistics. Data and statistics aren't research per se, but they can be used to inform decisions or to conduct research. And do we have plenty of data and statistics for you? In fact, the DCJS statistics webpage available on the public DCJS site has all kinds of data, reported crime, arrests, demo demographics. And actually, even though there is a plethora of data up there right now, we're working on a redesign of that DCJS stats page. So it is still accessible for you, but we're working to make it even more easier to navigate. And that will be coming in the very near future. <laughs> We also, of course, have the Integrated Justice Portal or eJustice New York. And there's valuable data and resources up there. It's not just rap sheets. So next time you're on the portal, please click around. Other information that DCJS makes available are model policies and standards. Through the MPTC, DCJS has on its website best practice guidance for 10 areas and topics. And this uh, can include everything from facial recognition to sexual assault evidence collection. So 
So check out the MPTC best practice guidance. And also LEAP, the Law Enforcement Accreditation Program. There are uh, even, there's a manual of accreditation standards. And even if you aren't actually pursuing accreditation for your agency, the materials here and the standards and best practices can be of great use to you. I know we have prosecutor friends in the audience today. And so by all means, check out the material that NIPTI and DASNI has to offer. And for the probation professionals, DCJS's Office of Probation and Correctional Alternatives has a suite full of information, including best practice research. And here, this last one, is what we like to think of as our featured avenue for law enforcement research. The Criminal Justice Knowledge Bank and the Criminal Justice Research Consortium, which we'll be taking a deeper dive into in just a few moments. Okay, and uh, one last slide, what's available from national sources. And these are all excellent resources for criminal justice research. Of course, we have the NIJ's website, which has information on its own site and also runs the very popular crimesolutions.gov clearinghouse. There's the Police Executive Research Forum, or PERF, the American Society of Evidence-Based Policing, the Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policy is another one. This one is out of George Mason and has really good innovative work. And there are many, many more similar resources discussing evidence-based and research as it relates specifically to the criminal justice field. So I've already talked for way too long. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Amanda McGlinchey Tudor, who's going to take you through the DCJS Criminal Justice Knowledge Bank and some of the neat new stuff going on there. Thank you very much. Amanda? Thank you, Mark. Uh, my name is Amanda McGlinchey Tudor, and I oversee the Knowledge Bank, which I'm going to provide you a brief overview of. Uh, but if you'd like to follow along, feel free to log into the website. And the, the link is knowledgebank.criminaljustice.ny.gov. The Knowledge Bank is an online resource for criminal justice practitioners, law enforcement, uh, district attorneys, uh, probation officers, and it went live in 2017. And DCGS developed this as a way to provide additional support and resources to help improve local practices using data and the Knowledge Bank is comprised of three main components. The first are the uh, program profiles, which I will go into more detail on. Um, we also have a research consortium, as has been mentioned, that I will turn it over to my colleague, Jessica, in a few moments. And we also have a resources page. And the resources page provides easy access to national resources um, and information within the field. Now, this is not meant to be an all-encompassing uh, source, but it does uh, bring you to some of the major resources that are available. Um, if you know exactly what you're looking for, you could always type it into the keywords section, or if you were looking for, say, uh, who provides technical assistance, you can filter down that way. Additionally, this year, we added a COVID resources page, which is a reference repository for law enforcement related COVID-19 information uh, from New York State, from the CDC, and professional associations. This gets updated as needed, so feel free to take a look to see if anything would be of uh, help to you. But as I said, I'm going to focus more on the program profiles page today. This is where we can summarize promising and innovative practices that are being implemented all across New York. So from New York City all the way across to up and across to Niagara. Um, they have a concise and structured format um, and all profiles share the same components. First is that we outline the problem that the uh, program is trying to address. So what exactly was the catalyst for 
the program uh, or practice to be implemented within that agency. We describe the program or practice. What are the key components? This is not meant to be uh, an operations manual, but really to give a high level, but detailed uh, enough detailed information to get a flavor of what the program or practice is. Uh, we describe the implementation and any research that the program is grounded in. And then we also highlight any program reviews or evaluations that have been conducted. One of our favorite parts of the profiles is that we highlight some of the lessons learned by the agency who implemented the program. So if there was any helpful or useful information that would be relevant for another agency to know and hear um, if they were interested in doing something similar. Um, our most uh, our most recent profiles uh, share some of the additional information about how they might have changed course during COVID, or if they had to temporarily make any changes due to the current climate. And all of our profiles feature direct contact information for the agency or the uh, and the person who's most directly involved in the program, so that they would you would be able to answer any additional questions for an agency would be interested in something in implementing something similar within their own agency. Um, it kind of eliminates that middleman so you can contact them uh, directly. Currently we have uh, 16 profiles that um, are featured on the Knowledge Bank. These cover various program areas. They, they feature uh, uh, program areas, uh, topics anywhere ranging from domestic violence, to drug and alcohol treatment, to um, uh, violence reduction, or any kind of uh, education or training. And again, they cover the entire state from, um, from New York all the way up. Um, we have 16 profiles featured, but we do have five new ones that we are really excited to, uh, to show um, uh, today, to share today. Um, I am going to Share the first one, but I'll go in. I'll, I'll show you the flow of it after I describe it. So, one of our new profiles is out of New York County, and it's the district attorney's office who has Inside Criminal Justice, which is a six week seminar where prosecutors and incarcerated individuals from a local correctional facility take part in in depth and respectful conversations about the criminal justice system. And as I said, I'll use this one as an example, just to show you what the profiles look like. We provide obviously this overview of a brief description of what the profile is, and then some quick facts about either the profile or the, uh, excuse me, the program or the agency itself. Again, we describe the problem. What again is the reason why the, pro the agency decided to implement this particular program or practice? We provide that program description, which again, as you can see, is detailed, but not overly comprehensive or completely comprehensive. We also look at the funding. What, uh, how, how are these programs supported within that agency? Is it a grant? Is it something that could be supported within their own, um, within their own uh, budget? Our research section again looks at uh, if there's been any kind of a program review or evaluation. And if, what is that research that is grounded, uh, that has grounded the program or practice? Our advice section is, is again, these kind of, um, what, are, what are the really important factors that have led to success within the program? And what were some of the challenges that the, that the agency experienced and how they overcame them? In our additional comments section, this is also where we would feature any um, changes to the, co uh, to the program due to COVID. And additionally, we have a print, uh, printable version of the profile. So if there was something that you would rather have as a physical um, physical paper to hold onto or to download, this would be where you could do it. And then finally, this is again, where we have the, uh, the contact information for that practitioner that you could email or contact directly if you wanted to learn more information about how this could be implemented within your own agency. We have another pro, uh, a prosecution profile out of Albany County, 
It's the sexual assault nurse examiner's mock trials. And the DA in Albany County provides a legal overview and a mock trial experience to sexual assault nurse examiners who are in training and are preparing to learn about expert, how to give expert testimony. We have two new probation profiles. The first that I'll talk about is out of uh, down in Queens, out of the New York City Department of Probation. And this is called the Queens Interim Probation Domestic Violence Team, which is a specialized DV probation program uh, that provides appropriate interventions and aims to enhance uh, offender accountability and also increase victim safety. Another probation program that we have is out of Monroe County. And uh, the agency there provides peer support for probation officers who are experiencing stress by promoting healthy coping skills and uh, offering referrals. And the last new profile that I'll highlight is out of Albany County Sheriff's Office. This is the Sheriff's Heroin Addiction Recovery Program, or also known as SHARP. And the jail provides uh, jail-based drug treatment services and discharge planning directly out of the Albany County Correctional Facility. So we very much encourage you to take a, a deeper look at these new profiles and the other existing profiles. If you have a specific uh, topic that you're interested, either just looking at law enforcement, or if you wanted to just focus on a particular topic like domestic violence, you can filter down pretty easily within these within our filter system. We are always looking for more profiles so if, and more content. So if you feel like you have, um, especially given this current climate um, with law enforcement, if you have a particular program or practice that you think would be helpful um, for other agencies to be aware of, if you've had to adapt uh, during COVID um, or create a new program because of COVID, these are things that we would absolutely love to hear from you about. Um, DCGS does try to do the bulk of the work so that we don't put too much uh, burden on you. So you can very easily email us and I'll just scroll down very quickly. But at the bottom of our page, you can easily contact us um, through email at the link at the bottom left. Or if you know that you have a profile you'd like to uh, submit, you can go to the Get Involved tab and go down to Submit a Program. Um, you would provide us with some of the basic information um, and any and any uh, supporting materials you might have, and then we will follow back up with you with uh, additional questions that we might have. And then you would receive a final draft um, before anything is ever posted to the website, just to make sure that we didn't misrepresent anything or misstate anything. So with that, I am going to turn it over to my colleague Jessica Damra, so she can describe more about our. Uh, research consortium. That's good. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, before we get to our panel, I'm just going to take a few minutes to give you some background on what the research consortium is and how it works. So DCGS's research consortium facilitates partnerships between criminal justice practitioners and college and university based researchers to develop research-based solutions to real-world problems facing agencies. The goal of the consortium is to expand criminal justice research and to promote the use of data and the adoption of research-based evidence into local criminal justice agencies. The practitioner, whether it be a police department, a district attorney's office, a sheriff's office, or a probation department, will request research assistance through the consortium through our online web form, which you will find on the Knowledge Bank website under the Get Involved uh, tab there. And if you click Request Assistance, it will take you to a page that sort of, again, explains a little bit about um, the, the consortium, and then you could also you would download the form there. So the practitioner may have a researcher in mind that they want to work with. Uh, the agency with a local interested academic partner who is a member of the consortium. We do have a stable of 67 academic partners from 32 institutions around the state. 
uh, who already have expressed an interest in providing New York State criminal justice agencies with research assistance. So we do have a map on our website there, and it just kind of gives you a, a feel of where our partners are located across the state and a list of participating institutions. So under the projects tab here, um, there are just a few examples of the type of, of assistance an academic partner can provide uh, generally, but it varies greatly. Uh, a key feature of the consortium is that we really want it to be flexible to the needs of the practitioner. So for instance, researchers can help analyze local criminal justice data, develop a data collection system, survey the community, or assess program impact. Again, these are just a few examples. If you have an issue you would like help with or you want to sort of talk through, I encourage you to contact UCGS and uh, you know, we'd be happy to see if the consortium is something that could help you. So after an initial screening by DCJS, the academic partner and the practitioner work together uh, on developing a project proposal and submit it to DCJS for approval. DCJS supports approved projects with small local assistance grants, uh, and the length of the projects can vary. Some are shorter, about three to six months. Some can be longer, up to 24 months. Here also under the projects tab, you can find a list of completed consortium projects that have a research brief posted. Once a project is complete, DCGS prepares a brief to post on the Knowledge Bank website that quickly summarizes the project, project's background, methodology, and findings with contact information for the agency that completed the project. So here, for instance, is a brief describing a project that was conducted in partnership between the Niagara County District Attorney's Office and researchers from Niagara County. And they exam, or sorry, researchers from Niagara University that examined the relationship between 911 calls and gun violence. As you can see, these are meant to be high level summaries of the research for practitioners who are interested in the work. And by providing direct contact information for the practitioners who did the work, they are designed to foster direct connections between interested agencies and project participants. So lastly, I just wanted to point out that there is contact information on the website uh, towards the bottom. If you'd like to reach out to DCGS with any questions or for more information, uh, you can reach me at uh, this, this information that's provided here. And with that, I will hand it back over to Mark to introduce our panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica, for that overview. Very helpful. <clears throat> and I would like to thank um, our panelists for joining us today. So I will start off uh, by introducing them and then we'll get to hear a little bit about this uh, really interesting work being done out in in Western New York, Central Western New York. <clears throat> our first panelist, Chief Dave Cathaldi, has more than 25 years of law enforcement experience and is a veteran of the United States Air Force having served with the Air Force Security Police during Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Chief Cathaldi has been with the Brighton Police Department for more than 20 years and has served in nearly every position within the department, including having managed both the department's Criminal Investigation Division and the department's Patrol Division before ultimately being named Chief of Police in 2019. <clears throat> Chief Kaflaudi holds a Master's of Arts in Administrative Leadership from the University of Oklahoma and is a graduate of the 249th session of the FBI's National Academy. Thank you for joining us, Chief. Joe Testani is the Director of the Justice and Security Institute at Roberts Wesleyan College in Rochester, New York. Prior to joining JSI, Director Testani spent more than 30 years with the FBI, serving in Boston, Philadelphia, and most recently in the Bureau's Rochester office. Joe's wealth of investigative and managerial experience gained him recognition of one of the Bureau's top innovators, and he was involved in the development of several national initiatives related to national security, counterterrorism, and risk management. 
As the director of the Justice and Security Institute, Mr. Testani currently oversees the development of cutting edge training with a focus on the emerging field threat assessment and threat management. And last, but certainly not least, Jessica Damrath is a criminal justice policy analyst in the Office of Justice Research and Performance within the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services. Jessica has been with DCJS since 2017 and manages the state's criminal justice research consortium you just heard about. Prior to joining DCJS, Ms. Damrath was the principal legislative analyst for criminal justice policies and programs with the New York State Assembly. Ms. Damrath holds a Master's of Public Administration with an emphasis on crime and justice policy from Rockefeller College at the University of Albany and a Bachelor's of Arts in Political Science from SUNY Cortland. Thank you all three of you for taking the time to chat with our audience today. So, I guess the most uh, logical place to start is to ask, for you to tell us a little bit about the research project that's currently underway. What is it about and what are you hoping to better understand? You wanna take that one or you want me to? No. Uh, I, I can take it. Sorry about that. Having trouble with uh, uh, my mute button. Um, so this this project uh, actually came about uh, relative in about 2018. Um, I sat on a committee to look at diversity in the, some of the police departments here in Monroe County, and we realized that uh, we were all struggling with diversifying our police departments. And we know that to have trust and legitimacy with the communities we serve, we need to be representative of those communities. So, so really, in essence, what we're trying to do is trying to recruit more diverse workforce. And uh, we're realizing that we don't know enough about why we cannot diversify our police departments. And I attended a symposium back in Albany, heard about the Criminal Justice Knowledge Data Bank, and Director Sestani and Robert Wesleyan host, they had a very small sample study in 2018 uh, where they began to take a look at this issue and uh, we needed to do a bigger, bigger study of it. And it was just a, a no brainer to partner with Robert Wesleyan in the knowledge, uh, criminal justice knowledge data bank, put some surveys out in the field uh, with Joe's expertise in the institute that he oversees. Uh, we were able to do that and again let me just step back and just say thank you to dcjs and uh jessica they've been instrumental in this project we couldn't have lift couldn't have gotten this off the ground um so i'll turn it over to joe uh let's talk a little bit more about it no i think uh i think dave covers that right uh you know that's the the goal of the project is to um take the temperature of the black community to see uh why or if they uh, value a job in law enforcement, what we can do to change that. Thank you, Chief, and thank you, Director Testani. So I heard that this uh, this idea of minority recruitment is something that JM and I had been uh, working on previously before the consortium project with Brighton. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about where the idea for this project came from or how the per how your partnership began. Yeah, I'll I'll grab that. So Dave uh, alluded to that in the uh, first question. We had uh, been contacted by Dave and other chiefs in our area over at the JSI uh, because they had uh, been trying to figure out this issue of minority recruitment, um, being criticized a little bit in the media, and they had a bit of a frustration around that because they had been working to uh, to increase the diversity of their departments, but couldn't get the uh, candidate pool uh, where they needed it to be. They just weren't getting enough applicants to to be very clear about it. 
So uh, they were trying to figure that out, came to us. And as Dave said, we started a small study. I think it was even back in 2017. And uh, from the data that we collected from that small study, we found uh, you know some interesting results, but uh, they weren't statistically valid based on the return that we had. And uh, equally as important, um, the respondents that we had didn't fit the demographic for hiring, uh, meaning the age demographic. For some reason, in our initial study, we had a lot of respondents who are over the hiring age for most police departments. So we realized we needed to retool that a little bit. Thank you, Director. Okay, uh, either uh, Chief or Director, maybe you could uh, talk for a moment about what the process for applying for support through the DCGS Research Consortium was like. How, how, how did that work out? I'll, I'll grab that, Dave. Again, since we were the primary applicant for this, and and then certainly, please, Chief, feel free to jump in. Um, what, what we did was, uh, you know, we through uh, Dave's request to try and improve and, and uh, our recommendation to increase the study, we reached out to Jessica and we filled out a request for assistance form as a uh, consortium member. And uh, the team, uh, Jessica's team had some questions. We had a couple of, of meetings regarding our request for assistance. Uh, ultimately, they asked us to fill out a project proposal. Uh, we worked on a project proposal, drafted that project proposal. Dave and his team looked at it. Uh, we sent it on to Jessica at DCJS and uh, get another couple of meetings to answer some questions, maybe uh, retool the proposal a little bit. And then um, it sounded like DCJS was interested in supporting that. We were asked to submit a budget uh, Dave and I worked on a, a budget, again, not to, to sound like a broker record, but we had a few more meetings with them to understand the nuances of, of what could be funded by DCJS and what couldn't. We finally submitted our final proposal and budget, and uh, thankfully, as David said, DCJS approved that so that we could uh, get this project underway and hopefully help, help Brighton and other departments in our region. Did I miss anything on that, Dave? No, I don't think so. Uh, in, on my end, internally, it was rather simple. I think any time that you can go to your elected officials, you know, I'll be here at the town board to say that you want to apply for free money to study a topic. Um, you know, we jumped at the chance. Uh, and, and again, Jessica's uh, role in this can't be unplayed. Um, I know sometimes as uh, chief executives, uh, we have a lot on our plates, a lot to do. And uh, it's just one more thing when you accept a grant application with all the backside of it, it's your quarterly reports are done. And uh, DCGS has just been a really great partner in that. Agreed. Okay, hey, Jessica, maybe you could uh, jump in here for a second and tell us a little bit about that free money or uh, actually tell us about what uh, DCGS requires and uh, what type of assistance DCJS provides to get one of these consortium projects off the ground. Sure, well, um, you know, I, I think that Director Tassani uh, covered it pretty well um, in terms of what their, what their process was is um, pretty much what the process is for, for any individual looking for assistance. Um, DCJS requires that practitioners first complete a request for assistance form which, as I mentioned earlier, is on the Knowledge Bank website. This forum asks for some basic information, including a brief description of the kind of research assistance you are seeking and whether or not you have already engaged an academic partner. And again, if you haven't, that's okay. Um, you know, we can help connect you with a researcher who has already expressed an interest in working with criminal justice agencies. It just so happened in this case that Chief Cavaldi and Director Tistani had already had a relationship and that that happens uh, with other projects that we have as, as well. Um, from there, we, we asked part, the partners to submit a more thorough proposal of the project, including details on the purpose of the project and the project design, as well as a proposed budget uh, that will, if the project will require funding through the consortium. Once the 
project proposal is approved, DCGS works with the partners to develop and execute a contract that includes mutually agreed upon deliverables, uh, such as an interim, such as interim progress reports from the researcher to the practitioner. Um, at every one of these steps, really, DCGS is available to help both the practitioner and the academic partner get the project off the ground. Our Office of Justice Research and Performance, where um, you know Mark and myself and Amanda are located, and uh, our colleagues in the Office of Program Development and Funding are there to help with um, contract execution, project project development. Um, you know, as Director Tistani said, we were um, in constant communication, just trying to to make sure we could get the best uh, proposal off the ground and as quickly as we could. Um, the development and implementation of a consortium project is really a collaborative effort and our offices are in frequent contact with the partners as the project develops. Thanks, Jessica. So it sounds like although DCJS is providing administrative report of uh, support, it seems like Largely, there's kind of a a home rule uh, at play here in which the local practitioner and research partner are kind of steering the ship and steering the project. So, um, so with that said, maybe back to Director Testani and Chief Cathaldi as collaborators and partners. How did you two work together to agree upon a project design and deliverables for your specific project and Kind of what holds each partner accountable while your project is underway? Well, let me start off. Uh, so, uh, Director Sistani and I, uh, we knew each other from a professional relationship when he was with the FBI. So, we had that certain base layer of trust. Uh, we had uh, several meetings prior to the, to the actual applying for the grant. Uh, some back and forth over the specifics, uh, who we're going to distribute it to um, in you know, like anything, best laid plans, uh, COVID came along. So we had to kind of work through that and some things changed a little bit uh, with COVID. Uh, but we do talk a couple of times a quarter. Uh, we briefed the DCGS uh, via email, telephone. Uh, we reviewed the survey questions when we had our kickoff meeting. Uh, the media was there. Uh, went through each one of the survey questions. We agreed upon the, the form and content of those. And we agreed uh, on a general timeline, but again, with COVID, some things uh, may get uh, uh, moved around a little bit. Um, but but that's it. And if, Joe, if you have anything else to add, yeah, Dave, I think you you covered it. I agree uh, from beginning to end. It was easy to work with the chief. We knew each other, and uh, as a former practitioner, I understood the need to make sure that we were servicing uh, Dave the way he and his team wanted to be serviced. Jessica and her team uh, can't stress it enough. You know, we, we kind of glossed over pretty quick. We had some forms, we filled them out and had a couple meetings, but those meetings were instrumental in us understanding the process and making sure we delivered to DCJS what they needed to better understand what we were trying to accomplish. And it was, it was very, very easy, uh, you know, quite honestly, it was, it almost seemed too easy for me, having been in the federal system. Well, we appreciate that, Director. Um, so, how's it going now? Uh, you know, the chief obviously mentioned uh, some course adjustments uh, necessary due to COVID. But uh, where are you with the project now? What's what's currently going on out in the field, and and what are your next steps? Well, we uh, worked through uh, the process of designing our survey. Originally, as the chief said, COVID threw us a hard curveball. We had hoped to uh, be in person. What we did, I should back up, uh, what we had proposed was to lower the uh, age bracket of our main targeted audience for surveying, uh, trying to make sure that we got enough respondents in the recruitable age bracket for law enforcement. So we focused on high schools and uh, colleges where we thought individuals would be forming their decision on whether or what type of job they wanted to take um, and, and whether the police department fit into that. So we uh, wrote a proposal for that. We were going to go out to uh, local high schools and colleges uh, we partnered with our Office of Diversity and Equity on campus. 
uh, and the two of us, the director for that office on Roberts Wesleyan College and myself, intended to go out and have uh, discussions with students to engage them on this topic to get their feeling and then have them create some excitement around the topic, have them fill out the survey. And in particular, after the uh, death of George Floyd over the summer and the uh, protests that surrounded that, we thought uh, even more of an important topic and a sort of social issue that we could discuss. But, but COVID didn't, uh, didn't let us follow through with that. So we went to, to a digital format and the questions became even more important so we uh, had a researcher that worked for us, make sure that uh, we had created unbiased questions that were going to derive the answers that we needed to inform the departments. That's all been done. And uh, we've got our digital survey prepared, our questions uh, designed and uh, reviewed. We brought them uh, not uh, just to our researcher, but to Dave to make sure that they fit in with his vision. And then uh, we put them through our Office of Diversity and Equity to make sure that there were appropriate questions for the audience that, that uh, we were bringing the questions to. And we've actually started to distribute the survey. They've been uh, sent out through one uh, entire school district. As a matter of fact, the district liked our intentions so much that uh, they asked if they could send the survey out to not just uh, the students, but to any guardian of the students registered at school. And of course, we would be happily take any more data that we could get uh, from the uh, community. So we were, our survey's been submitted and, and out to the uh, one district and um, one community college. And we are currently working with the charter schools in the city of Rochester to have it distributed next week. We're actually getting responses in and uh, you know, we're getting some interesting results from the survey, surprising results. Does that answer your question, Mark? Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. Well, now I'm going to transition a little bit. And uh, if the panelists don't mind, I'm going to kind of ask a few general questions. For you, Chief Cathaldi, from a practitioner's point of view, not specific to your project, but just from a practitioner's point of view, what is the value in engaging with an academic research partner? And what does the criminal justice practitioner get out of one of these arrangements? How does this benefit you as a law enforcement executive? Well, a couple of the immediate uh, things, I, I received a lot of positive feedback from the elected officials whom I report to. And uh, we have a very strong partnership with our schools here in the town of Brighton. Received a lot of positive feedback from the community and school administrators. And, and I think anytime that we can partner with an academic institution, a lot of times as uh, law enforcement, we tend to do things the way we've always done them and because we think that they work for us. I think when I can provide and go back to those my elected officials with hard data on why we want to do something and how we can improve our operations here in the police department. I think that's a win-win for, for anybody. We're very fortunate here that uh, we have two of the research partners, uh, RIT and Roberts Wesson, right here in the Monroe County. And uh, I do believe that evidence-based uh, research and evidence-based policing is going to be the future of our profession seen it in the governor's uh, executive order. Uh, most of us, uh, and I'm sure many of the attendees on this panel are either finalizing or in the, the last days of finalizing their plans uh, to reform and reimagine policing. And one of the one of the tenets of that is evidence-based policing. And, and I think this just goes to, to help foster that. Um, and, and quite frankly, education's uh, very valued in this community. We have a very well-educated community. Uh, the University of Rochester is literally right down the road. It's a stone's throw from Brighton. So we have a, a lot of uh, professors and uh, those in academics that live in Brighton. And when I can go back to the, to, the, to the community and saying that we're taking a hard look and we're really researching on what we're doing and we want to put our best foot forward, I think it's uh, received uh, very well. Excellent. Thank you, Chief. And now over to uh, Director Testani. I know you mentioned that uh, you and the chief had a professional relationship uh, from, from your tenure with the FBI, but let me ask you this. How can academics best support law enforcement 
and criminal justice agencies with research assistance. As the research practitioner, do you generally follow the lead of the law enforcement practitioner or do you come up with your own research questions or is it some sort of combination of, of the two of these? I'll take the first part of that. Uh, as a former practitioner, um, I understand that your primary function is to uh, to protect the public, to catch bad people doing bad things. Some of these side issues, um, we don't have the funding for, we don't have the bandwidth for. This allows, you know, law enforcement agencies and the practitioners to sort of hand that off to someone that's been vetted by DCJS in New York State and trusted by the law enforcement agency to handle this problem that's there for them that they might not have the time or the resources or or uh, are overburdened with other matters so it, it gives you that uh, i think a luxury to have that it is sort of a force multiplier uh, the knowledge bank is for most law enforcement agencies in new york state from my perspective as the academic so i think uh, you know it's a huge relief for them then as dave said you can give it to someone who has that expertise to design those questions that won't be biased, um, that will get the results that you need. Now, I would say we listen to the practitioner partner, understand what, uh, try to come away with an understanding of what problem they're trying to resolve, and then we we create that solution that we think gives you the best, uh, fairest, most unbiased evidence to present back. But before we implement it, we, we bring it back to the practitioner, to our partner. And so it's got to be, to answer the second part of your question, a collaboration between the two and utilizing what we're experts in. They're experts in practicing the art of law enforcement, and we should be experts in gathering academic-based uh, research and, and evidence for them to best do that. So when you have that back and forth exchange, I think you get the best results and the best product and that communication should help everybody stay uh, satisfied uh, and, and uh, content with the project. And again, as we, we discussed before, we do it, Dave and I talk regularly, I mean, we have quarterly reports we have to fill out, but as an example, I sent them just an email the other day to let them know that uh, the survey just went out to our local community college and uh, one, he wants that situational awareness if somebody speaks to him about it. And two, I think he wants to understand that the project continue to move forward. Great. So I'm hearing collaboration and, and frequent contact and communication are key between the practitioner and the academic. Absolutely. How, how about lessons learned? Have there been any aha moments so far, either related to your minority recruitment project or even just about the process of collaborating? Well, as I alluded to earlier, COVID has been a little bit of a challenge. I, I don't know if we could have really planned for that. I don't think anybody could have. Um, you know, we went from doing in-person physical surveys to a virtual digital format. You know, it is a very sensitive topic. We did have several meetings with the community representatives and administrators in the school uh, to get buy-in. Uh, ultimately, I do believe that everybody understands what we're trying to do, and we're trying to make things better. Um, you know, we have a very strong partnership with our uh, local high school, and you know, we had several back and forth, uh, both uh, Director Sestani and I, just to make sure that everybody was on the same page and, and exactly to state what our purpose was. Um, having those relationships in the community, I think, has been very instrumental. If I did not have that in the community, I, I think there would have been a little bit more uh, pushback uh, putting these surveys out in the field. And really, the the only other thing is clear clear lines of who's doing what uh, as far as uh, reporting quarterly reports. I, that's important. Um, try not to forget the uh, federal reporting requirements. We get uh, we're inundated with emails. Report this and report that, and just uh, make sure that uh, when you partner with that academic institution, which in this case has been fine, just make sure who's doing what as far as the uh, reporting requirements. Thank you, Chief. And uh, we're starting to uh, to run low on time. And I do want to save a little bit of time for uh, questions from the audience and a reminder to audience members that you could submit any questions that you have by using the Q&A function associated with WebEx. 
we have had a couple come in so far. Um, but uh, before we before we get to those audience submitted questions, can I ask the uh, the exciting question of when we can expect to see some results from your Brighton project? I, I know this topic. Uh, you know, there's lots of interest within the law enforcement community right now. Yeah, I'll, I'll grab that since we're doing the work on it. Um, we have uh, committed to having everything wrapped up by August, but to be honest with you, one benefit of uh, the COVID uh, making this go digital has made it a little bit easier for us to collate the data. So we anticipate uh, in the spring, we should have all of our results. Uh, the system that we're utilizing for the digital survey collates it for us. And we'll do an analysis of that, and we should be done a little bit earlier than anticipated. Great. And, um, you know, shortly thereafter, DCGS will post a summary of the project um, in our research brief um, that will include results, and uh, that will be posted on the Knowledge Bank website. Thanks, Jessica. So, folks could ultimately tune back in here to the uh, to the Research Consortium website and, and, and see the outcomes of, of this Brighton project. That's Can great. Can I add one thing to that, Mark? Just uh, when we created this survey and, and took on this project with Jessica and Dave, part of uh, our intentions were to make sure that this was uh, repeatable. And so the questions have all been designed and developed. It'll be specific regarding our region because that's who we polled. Or you can just take this survey and resubmit it for another region, and you should be able to replicate the results that we're going to see in Rochester. Thank you very much for that, uh, Director. And and you know that's perfect because you know we've received a couple questions. One of which was regarding you know your work and looking at minority recruitment. You know the question was: Are, are you really looking solely at your locality or your, your geographic area, or have you been looking at the issue of minority recruitment kind of from a, a larger perspective as well? Yeah, so I think we, we partially answered that, which is since we're conducting the survey only within our region, the results will be specifically applicable to our region. We shouldn't assume that the climate in another region would be the same, but we can take some of it away, I think, and take some lessons learned for a bigger picture. Uh, also, uh, as an example, we're seeing that social media drives a lot of the impression of people in the age demographic we're looking at, and I think that'll be applicable across the board. Here's the question that Jessica, maybe you can uh, answer. We have a question from an audience member who'd like to know if there has been uh, any research done about the technology platforms currently in use by New York State law enforcement, particularly CAD or records management system or reporting systems, and uh, how you know departments are finding those and migrating to new platforms. Are you familiar with uh, if if there's been either uh, research on this through um, either through the consortium or, or else elsewise? Yeah, um, you know, I don't know that we've had a, a consortium project that has specifically looked at that issue in terms of migrating to new platforms. I do think um, Buffalo Police Department had a, a sort of multi-pronged uh, research project that had to do with several aspects of their gun violence response. And part of that, I think, was um, uh, uh, modernizing their records management system in some way. So it might have been one part of our Buffalo um, consortium project that they did a few years ago. Uh, we could uh, certainly feel free to to look. That brief is posted on our website. Um, you can get a sense of what they did and, um, you know, uh, uh, feel free to reach out if you're looking for more information on that. Thank you, Jessica, for that. And also the DCJS Office of Criminal Justice Records, OCJR, I know they are partnering with local agencies, uh, you know, to help with the NIVERS and IBR transition as that pertains to record management systems and reporting systems. So, uh, you know, that may be a good resource as well. 
Another question that uh, we have coming up from the audience, um, it's two pronged and uh, it asks whether this specific project has been uh, considering ROTC as a potential resource or avenue for minority recruitment. And also asking about um, your, your examination, does it include just recruitment as in bringing uh, more diversity into the police department at the entry levels, or does it also relate to promotion and movement within the department of uh, minorities? How about I, I'll grab the first part and uh, Dave, I think you can, if you want to grab the second part about uh, promotion. So we, we did not look at specifically ROTC, um, though that's a, a good idea and a good point. And maybe based on the uh, demographic, when they fill out the information regarding their background for the survey, we can correlate some data to ROTC and their interest. In it. But again, a very, very easy tool for us to take the survey that's already been created and uh, speak to individuals in the ROTC programs at our local colleges and uh, get that survey distributed to see if um, there, there's uh, some data in there that's helpful to the departments. Yeah, and I, and I would say, I think if I understand the question correctly, um, you know, first, First, we have to get the applicants and we have to get them hired. Um, you have to have that pool of applicants to get them promoted. And that's that's a lengthy process. Uh, you know, we're a small department of 40, 40 sworn officers. So to get people into that pipeline at an early stage, you're talking 10 to 15 years before somebody can get promoted, sergeant, lieutenant, and all the way up through. But it starts with a pool of candidates. And you know we're governed by civil service laws and you know, just for instance, a population of 36,000, I had five candidates on a, on a local hometown list. So those are some of the things we're struggling with. We have to get a larger pool of candidates identified and into that pipeline earlier to help diversify our departments 10, 15 years down the road. Thank you, Chief. And I love the fact that we're getting questions here that, uh, you know, ask questions that may in fact be outside the scope of this current project because you know with that I'd like to say certainly the research consortium is open for business so if there is an issue related to a different area of minority recruitment something completely different you know records management we talked about or something you know you know like I said and anything else remember the uh, the consortium is open for business and looking for uh, for new projects to support. And, uh, you know, that is a perfect segue for the last question that we received. And um, that question was, what's can to make the collaborative a safe space for law enforcement, especially in instances when the practitioner and the researcher don't know each other, kind of one of those matchmaking situations, Jessica, that you were talking about earlier, where uh, DCJS makes the connection between an interested uh, law enforcement practitioner and and a research partner. So, so what what is done? Maybe Joe or Jessica, do you have any input on on, on how that can remain a safe space for law enforcement while conducting this type of research? Sure. Well, um, you know, I think it goes back to a lot of what Director Justani was talking about and what we've sort of um, said, you know, is important about the consortium and that's that's collaboration and communication. Um, you know, certainly we want um, an academic, it's important that an academic partner and a practitioner have a good working relationship and, and that doesn't necessarily have to be something that they come into the project with that can be you know, um, developed over time and at DCGS, uh, we're, you know, we, we want to serve as a bridge to bring those two partners together. Um, there is some more information on our website um, about identifying and working with a research partner um, where uh, um, on the, the page where we have the, the form to request assistance, there is a, um, there is a, a a PDF document with more information on, um, you know, what it means for a practitioner to work with a research partner and identifying an appropriate research partner. Um, so, 
you know, if you if you'd like more information about that, that's there. There's, um, you know, a, a plethora of internet uh, sources on working with a research partner, and um, you know, we're we're also happy to provide more information on that. I'll just stress that uh, <clears throat> I don't think you could have found a more um, sensitive or passionate subject than the one that uh, Dave and I partnered on in this current environment. And of course, we, we don't want to make any uh, missteps or mistakes or hurt anybody's reputation. And, you know, quite frankly, when we first started this study, we saw a lot of interest from the minority community. And it started with uh, how does this help us defund the police? And and clearly, I don't think Dave's interest in engaging us were to find ways to defund his department. But we were through our communication, uh, Dave and I constantly talking, and then engaging the community and showing them our genuine interest in improving, and them uh, seeing the, the genuine response from the chief and myself that uh, they embrace this and, and the minority community and leaders in that community have actually helped us get over some hurdles and get the survey disseminated. So I think the key to it has got to be that back and forth communication, which was easy for Dave and I because we'd worked together before. In the future, you know, my suggestion would just be to make sure that, that you clearly communicate and are engaged in each step of the process so there are no surprises and, and everybody both owns what goes out there. Thank you very much. And I want to uh, extend my thanks to all of our panelists, Director Testani, Chief Cathaldi, Jessica, thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I appreciate also all the audience members tuning in today. We hope that we'll hear from you at both our Knowledge Bank and Consortium programs. We hope that you're willing to share the great work that you're doing in your individual localities so that that can be repeated and utilized by your colleagues around the state. And we're, we're trying to help facilitate that. So with that, I'll turn this back over to Anthony, who will uh, close us out. Thank you for joining. Thanks, Mark. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you, our panel today for the presentation and the information you provide to us. Uh, if you have any questions, Please be sure to reach out to the DCS Office of Research of Justice Research and Performance. Uh, you can see the email addresses there on the screen. Um, I'd like to thank you all today for attending and remind you that we'll be hosting additional webinars throughout the year. Our next webinar is scheduled for March 2nd and is entitled Where to Look, a Law Enforcement Guide for Missing Person Searches. Um, and as a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and a link will be shared shortly. As you exit, please click on the red X uh, and please complete the evaluation that uh, you will be sent shortly. Again, thank you and have a great day. Thank you.